Coming up next on The Voice of Alabama Politics, our guest today is Jean and Logan Rose Church. Also, the V-Team takes a look at a new Star Chamber bill. And Speaker Mike Hubbard is praying that some cooked memos will set him free. No, Mike, it's the truth that sets you free. All the rest could land you in jail. All this and much, much more coming up next on The V. The Voice of Alabama Politics with your host, Bill Brett and the V-Team with Claire Austin, Susan Britt, Jack Campbell, Baron Coleman, Charlana Spencer, and special reports with Jonathan Barbie. Now, the number one political show in Alabama, The V. Welcome to the Voice of Alabama Politics, where we tackle the tough issues so you have the hard facts. I'm your host, Bill Britt, and as always, I'm joined by the V-Team. Welcome all. Good morning. Good, Good morning. Sunday morning. Easter. Easter Sunday. Yeah, Easter Sunday, and we have our bunny. Yes, we do. Thank you. Thanks to Claire. You're welcome. This week, this last week in Montgomery, the Senate passed a piece of legislation that I am calling the billion dollar Bob Obama style bailout. And what that legislation does is it allows Bob Riley to keep his scholarship granting organization afloat. An internal memo that we published in AL Reporter showed that if Bob Riley didn't get this bill passed, it was most likely that his SGO would be the first one to fail in Alabama. Susan, what about it? Yeah, it looks like it's actually designed for Bob Riley's SGO. And if it, if, if it does fail, that, what it is right now, they don't have enough money to renew the scholarships that they had last year. Right. They've got $12 million left over that they want to roll over. Well, according to the original Accountability Act, you can't roll that money over. So they're having to do a special bill to let them roll that money over to pair it with the new ceiling of $30 million and be able to cover what Bob Riley's losses are going to be. And there's also a tax loophole, isn't there? There yeah. is, yeah, because what it does is that lets you go back and claim donations for the 2014 year after the 2014 year is over. So you can go back now in the middle of 2015, file an extension on your 2015, 2014 taxes, and claim tax credits for last year. This is a very unusual thing that's not done in almost any other I, arena. Egregious. It sounds awfully egregious. I mean, the thing is, the, the fact is, we, we ran the numbers, and this gets Riley exactly, basically, where he needs to be to keep it open. They had uh, uh, 1,800 students that renewed, and they don't have the money. Leslie Searcy, who, who runs the, uh, the SGO, said back in December that they only had a little over $600,000. Well, just to get those kids back in school, you need... 15 to 15 million dollars just to renew them. They don't have it, Susan. No, they don't have it. And why? Because they say the Supreme Court messed them up. They say the Supreme Court, you know, that lawsuit messed uh, them the, up. The, the problem with that is other SGOs raked in the money during yeah. the last year while the exact same scenario was playing out. This thing was on appeal in front right. of the Alabama Supreme Court. Bob Riley's group raised 600000 Drayton Neighbors' group raised $13 million. Didn't right. seem to bother Drayton's donors. No, it didn't. But one of the things we understand is, is Riley's donors, which we don't know because the Accountability Act has no one that's accountable for it, his donors were all people he had done business with when he was governor. And these, these companies, they don't want to give $15, $25 million every year. They were like, hey, one and done. So he's having problems raising money. You know, the other thing that we were able to bring out this week, and we didn't know this, Leslie Searcy said the 990s, which are the tax, uh, what do you call those Tax return for nonprofits. Tax returns yeah. for nonprofits. They, she said we would find out under that, uh, their tax returns that Bob Riley didn't make any money. Well, what we found out under the tax returns is not only uh, we don't know how Bob made any money, but we know he doesn't own the SGO. The SGO is owned out of Florida by Step Up for Students. That was revealing, wasn't it? It was Susan? very. This is Curtley's group, <coughs> the group that we've looked at before, with, that had problems with SGOs. This, 
uh, Riley's SGO is a wholly owned subsidiary of Step Up for Students, which, who I think also has another SGO in Georgia as well. Well, it's just interesting. We all thought it was an Alabama-based SGO, and it's really not, Claire. Well, he used the one that had already been established, the gentleman out of Florida who was they were working with and pushing this. And obviously, it, from my understanding now, that uh, gov former Governor Riley is the chairman of that group. Is that correct? Right. He's the chairman of the uh, Alabama, and he's also uh, uh, tied into the group in Florida. And, and one of the interesting things we found, Baron, and I think you've looked over the 990s, this group has 300,000 plus in reserve after they have fulfilled all their scholarships. 300 million. 300 million, million. Right, 300 million including about 150 million in cash. That's taxpayer money that should have gone into classrooms in Florida, Georgia, and Alabama that is sitting in a bank account in Florida not going into the classroom. I mean, our schools here, Claire, they don't have textbooks. They don't have school supplies. I know. They don't even have toilet paper. And they're sitting down there with, with $150 million in cash. I mean, this is outrageous, isn't it? I mean, there needs to be some kind of accountability over these SGOs and these step-ups. I mean, if that, you know, with that kind of millions of dollars sitting in the bank account and reserves in these three states, the public education is... And I believe Roger Smitherman said it on the floor uh, just a few days ago when they were talking about the Accountability Act. It would take $60 million to get all the textbooks that Alabama students need, yet they're sitting on 120. Well, it's just amazing. I mean, that's Florida taxpayer money, but I mean, you know, this was interesting to find out. One thing we've only got about a minute to get to is they passed out of the committee that bill we talked about a couple, about a month ago, the Star Chamber bill that would give 12 legislators, 12 elite legislators, the right to say who got money, what agencies could be cut for money, and all this stuff after the fact. Baron, it is outrageous. It, it, it is completely outrageous. The governor has called it unconstitutional. To me, it's unconscionable that the legislative <laughs> body of 140 elected people would appropriate money to different agencies, and then they would turn around and say, no, no, no. We're going to redo it. We're, we're sending that money over here. It's unconscionable. I mean, it's a power grab. Right. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, it's, it, but it is really amazing, given the circumstances in the state of Alabama, with the leadership in the House, that, that he would have the audacity to get someone to introduce that bill that would allow those six in the House and those six in the Senate to basically control all of state I mean, government. I this and, is and a Mike the Hubbard out of bill. It I'm sorry. No, it's just a Mike Hubbard bill. It's his idea. Yeah, and it takes, it takes the governor out of the mix altogether. I bet you the first agency they would gut would be the Office of the Attorney General. Absolutely. <laughs> I wonder why. I can't imagine. Well, you know, the governor was on your show earlier this week, and he did Correct. say it was unconstitutional. Yeah, we had the governor on the radio show, and he said that he, we asked him about the bill. He said it's unconstitutional. Out. I mean, there was no well, hesitation. When does that stop them from passing bills that are unconstitutional? <laughs> well, it doesn't seem Sorry. to ever stop them, but we're going to have to hold it right there. You're watching The Voice of Alabama Politics. We'll be right back with some very special guests, Gene Church and his daughter, Logan Rose Church, the authors of Rose's Law. Stay tuned. The V is sponsored by Spot On Strategies Group. Welcome back to The Voice of Alabama Politics. We're joined today by Gene Church and his daughter, Logan Rose Church. Welcome. Hi, how are you doing? Doing great. Logan, how are you today? Doing well, how are you? I'm great. I appreciate you coming. We're talking about a very sensitive subject. 
In 1999, the Alabama State Legislature passed a bill named after your mother. You lobbied for that bill as a six-month-old child, probably the youngest lobbyist we've ever had in the state. That bill came about after the death of Rose Church, who had left the hospital early, had been discharged early from the hospital, and sadly died some days later. The bill has served the state for some 15 years, served the women, the men, the children of our state. Recently, a newly elected senator, Larry Stutz, tried to overturn that bill to have it repealed. What he did not tell his fellow colleagues in the Senate, in the Senate is that Dr. Stutz was in charge of your wife and mother's health care and that he settled a wrongful death suit as a result. I know this has to be a tender issue for you, but you and you're very courageous to stand up. How, Mr. Church, did you come to sponsor or to, to push Rose's Law, and what, it, what did it mean to you at the time, and what does it mean to you now? My wife died on December the 11th of uh, 1998, and it was on a Friday, and because of a number of circumstances, by the following day I had access to her medical records. And I became stunned because I wondered how somebody who was 36 years old and in reasonably good health uh, could die from childbirth. I mean, we hear about it in third world countries, but we don't really hear about it here in the United States. And right. so I, I, was, I was very surprised. And I looked in her records and it, there was a nurse's note that talked about her losing a large amount of blood. I thought, well, let me flip through here and see what the blood tests show uh, from that. And there were no blood tests. And it, it was confusing to me because I couldn't figure out how they could have possibly had been no blood work done. Now, you are an attorney, but you also have been involved in the nursing home field for years. So you have some experience in medical background. That's correct. I, I, since 1994, I, I've been president of a, a nursing home company. And, my, and, and as a result... I'm not really big on uh, uh, regulation being used in the area of health care anyway, so, so it is an interesting irony that I find myself in that particular position. So you looked at this situation and said something needs to be done for women in this type of situation. That's correct. One of the things I tried to do was address this uh, to try to mirror the federal law, but try to fix what looked to me to be a serious problem in the law. In the instance, in instance here, I considered that uh, if blood work were done on admission and discharge from the hospital, something that costs virtually nothing to do, that it would give the doctor the necessary information to determine whether complications were there. And the other thing was I recognized, because this was a time when HMOs were very powerful, I recognized that despite the fact the federal law said that they were not to put undue influence on physicians and hospitals, it didn't mean that that wasn't going, that there were not attempts to be done in that way. And so I wanted to shift the responsibility from the doctor who was having to have financial pressures on them to the patient who would be better suited to be able to make that decision. When you came to Montgomery and started speaking with legislators, what happened? Uh, Logan was a month old at that time. And uh, <clears throat> I uh, came bill in hand, had a, a beautiful old baby carriage that I had her in, and I was carrying a diaper bag and a briefcase and a suit. And, uh, and I made the rounds, uh, had a couple of sponsors, a House and Senate sponsor for the bill. And uh, I uh, went through and realized the, the real political dysfunctionality uh, that was the Alabama State House at that time. Nothing has changed. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it was particularly unique at that point. You had uh, Don Sigelman as governor, right. Democrat. Uh, you had Steve Windham, Republican lieutenant governor, and an 1815 split, or I'm sorry, 1817 split in the uh, Senate uh, between uh, conservatives and liberals. And it was a, uh, nothing could be, was, was getting through and nothing was going to be passed. But this did pass on bipartisan and unanimously, correct? Absolutely. And it, 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 we were able to make it through uh, both houses, and uh, it was the first uh, public signing ceremony that uh, Don Sigelman ever held. Hmm. Logan, you were named partially after your mother, Logan Rose Church. You came to Montgomery as a very small child. You hadn't been back. 
all this has to bring up a lot of feelings for you, a lot of thoughts for you. Can you share with us what this journey has meant to you and, and all these things that are coming up? Well, having this all come up again, it brought up a lot of emotions, like you said, that I'd kind of pushed away for a while. A lot of sadness and some anger um, that's tied into it. I've grown up with an amazing mom, you know, but through it all, there is that curiosity of what would my life have been like, you know, and so it's been a definite roller coaster. You've now, as a young woman, looked at this bill, looked at what it did, looked at how it has served your mother's uh, legacy. You think it's a good bill? Absolutely. No doubt about it. You hadn't faced this issue for almost 16 years. What did it do to you when this came back up and Dr. Stutz, who had been your wife's physician, now a senator, wanted to repeal it? I mean, how did that make you feel? Well, it was really kind of a punch in the gut. I, I really had long ago put this behind me, and, it, and I put it behind me without any real vendetta about, uh, about any of this. And so I was very stunned uh, about what was going on there and, and, and what was happening. But I also knew that I had no choice but to try to step back in and try to fix what was going on. I was very surprised. I didn't know that Larry had been even elected to the state Senate. I knew Roger Bedford had been defeated by someone. But I was not even as, in, as involved to know what was going on in North Alabama at the time. And so I was very, very surprised when I heard that, that Larry was making an attempt to get rid of Rose's Law. I mean, most of the people that I've talked to said that he withdrew this uh, law after pressure came down on him. That he's, he, he said he was going to not try to repeal this law. But I've heard from a lot of senators who have told me, that he plans on just lying low and coming back in the near future. You're a lawyer. What did his words mean to you when he parsed them so well? And that's precisely when I heard his initial statement that he made before he gave the final written statement at the end, both of the statements said to me, this isn't the last time that I'm going to hear about this or the last time that he's going to try to do this. Larry Stutz is simply wrong. And he is a petty little man on a vendetta. This isn't a Republican issue. This isn't a Democratic issue. This isn't a man versus woman issue. This bill passed unanimously in the Alabama legislature in 1999. And what we have here, he says he's concerned about uh, unnecessary regulation. We have hundreds of health regulations in this state. Isn't it amazing that one of the first things he picks out is the very law that he was tangentially involved in? I mean, both you and Logan, you have expressed to me that you're conservative. You have conservative values. Don't you think that protecting a woman's health, Logan, is a conservative value? Of course. Why should the health of a woman to a conservative be any different to one to a liberal? Shouldn't be, should it? Larry Stutz, I think, has done a bad thing. Let's hope that the voters next time recognize what a bad thing he's done, and send him home. Thank you all for being with us today. You're very good people, and we're very lucky to have you come back to Alabama and share with us. Thank you so much, Bill. You're watching The V. Our guests today have been Gene Church and his daughter, Logan. We'll be right back. The V is sponsored by Wind Creek Wetumpka. Find your winning moment. Welcome to Alabama's newest entertainment destination, Wind Creek Wetumpka, the perfect escape for date night, a getaway with your friends, or a relaxing poolside cocktail. Whether it's a day trip to enjoy the best steak in Alabama or a romantic weekend, the finest Southern hospitality is just a short drive away. Wind Creek Wetumpka, find your winning moment. Welcome back to The V, the voice of Alabama politics. Welcome, Jack Campbell. Thanks, sir, and good Easter to everyone. I know, you have a nice Easter well. frock as I well. I know, three more payments, Claire. 
<laughs> Jack, I know you watched the segment where we had Gene Church and uh, that beautiful young lady, Logan Rose Church. Right. I mean, what was your visceral response to what Larry Stutz did? You, you want to think in your heart of hearts that he did it for, for, for a good reason. But like so many of these people that get into office and figure out the system, they do things that are self-serving. And I think this, this bill is a total CYA effort. And uh, I think it's very unfortunate. And pretty much I think I ought to be run out of Dodge for it. You know, the Montgomery Advertiser uh, did an editorial where they said that they hoped his political career lasted about as long as he wanted a woman to be able to stay in the hospital. Man, that's heavy words, isn't it, Claire? It is. And, you know, I was, after we talked about this the week before, I mean, I called a lot of the senators so their, their, their names were signed on to this bill as co-sponsors, and they were not uh, given what I would call the Paul Harvey rest of the story. They really did not understand and know what they were signed on to. He kind of hoodwinked his colleagues. The, I heard that about several of them. I don't know if all of them. Tim Melson, who's from up in that area, who works at the hospital as an anesthesiologist, I heard he was still kind of on board with, with Stutz. But what are you hearing? Well, look, I mean, I think, I think uh, Mr. Church summed it up well. Out of all the hundreds and thousands of regulations dealing with health care, the first one he chooses to go after is the one that's named after a patient that died in his care. The second one he chose to go after was one sponsored by his opponent he just defeated and had to do with his wife's breast cancer. Right. This is the meanest, nastiest, pettiest man I've ever seen in state government. And that says a lot considering who our Speaker of the House is. But, but, but Larry Stutz makes Mike Hubbard look like an angel. I'm sorry, he just does. Those two bills, going after your dead patient and your opponent's breast cancer-stricken wife? My God, what's wrong with this man? Well, well that's vindictive. I it, mean, it really it, is. And, and, you know, I wrote something this week, and I said, you know, Larry Stutz, <coughs> excuse me, tried to mask this under Obamacare. He's talking about Obamacare. You know, this is Alabama's favorite punching bag is Obamacare. But this was not about a punching bag, Jack. This no. was about a body bag that contained the remains of a 36-year-old nurse. All these Republicans that we have in leadership, when, when in doubt, throw Obama's name out. I mean, you know, it's I just mean, the way it you is. You know, this is just outrageous. Well, it you. is. And, I, and, you know, as I mentioned, this is going to hurt the Republican Party. And I think yeah, maybe... Yeah, with women. It, you said that last women, week. Yeah, I said it last week because, you know, all throughout the nation, particularly in, in uh, presidential election cycles, the women voters are the one that the Republican Party is always short. Well, thanks to you, this kind of went viral. It did. Yeah. It went all over the nation. Thank you. Fact. Thank you. Yeah, we got picked up by the Washington Post. And Rachel uh, Maddow, I don't know if that's a badge of honor. Well, I, you know, I, <laughs> she did a great piece on that, she by did. the way. She did, did a very, very good piece. But I think nine or ten national outlets picked this up. It, it, it's a big story, and it, it should is. be a big story. Uh, you know, that other reporters didn't, didn't find it. I'm not surprised, unfortunately. Uh, we have an absent press corps. Uh, I tell you, th th this is and this is a good lead into our next thing. You know, Mike Hubbard has filed motion after motion after motion, and and these things have been known about him for years. And our press corps missed it on every turn. Missed it or neglected to report right. it. Or just they were hoodwinked and they just turned the cheek the other way. Yeah. Well, you know what happens when you turn the other cheek? Most of the time you hit again. You get hit again. But Baron, you know, they they've they've now come up with some Hail Mary motions where they're trying to get it dismissed for a, a number of reasons. Can you break that down for our audience? Yeah, it looks like one of the chief reasons Mike Hubbard wants to get these charges dismissed is some sort of prosecutorial misconduct where, where the prosecutor may have said mean things about Mike Hubbard behind closed doors or, or this kind of thing. And I'll just say this, our prosecutors, if, 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 if it was a grounds to dismiss something because a prosecutor said something mean about a potential criminal defendant, you would never have a murder conviction. Prosecutors say mean things about potential criminal defendants all the time. They run on these. They run. I mean, this is what district attorneys run on. I'm tough on crime. I don't like the bad guys. So it's, it's all nonsense. It's all smoke and mirrors. They're trying to put the prosecution on trial in the press and see if the press will there was, But there was prosecutorial misconduct, Baron. Problem is the prosecution, prosecutor was leaking information to the defense. Oh, this yeah, yeah, right. this Sonny prosecutor Reagan. was Sonny Reagan. Right. Yeah. Unbeknownst to his bosses in, who work for the state of Alabama. Well, the whole thing, they just keep trying to take the heat off of what's really going on in his 23 indictments, and they keep trying to file 
one thing after another after another just to try to create media and stories th to and this make is him the guy that better. said I, I'm looking forward to my day in court let's get this thing rolling and well, then let's roll it. he does all these stall tactics to keep him out of jail well I tell you he's kicking and screaming and and uh, you know the big show I think is April 15th, 15th. I think April 15th We've all seen it. They're throwing everything against the wall, hoping something stick. And I'm going to go out on a limb here. I believe that if they really get hammered hard, if Hubbard gets hammered at that, that hearing, they're going to fold the tents, cut a deal, and do the time. Makes sense, doesn't it, Claire? It does, but that's a tall order. I mean, you know, he's a little man on the fifth floor, and uh, he loves his money, his power, and control, and I... Well, that'll be a tough day for him. Well, maybe we can get the corrections officers to call him inmate, Mr. Inmate number 997. He may be going from filet to bologna here soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this has been an outrage for our state, a disgrace for our state. I mean, Bob Menendez has been asked to step down. He has to leave his, his post as uh, any authority he has. But yet Mike Hubbard clings to power. Jack, what is wrong with Alabama? I think we're just used to mediocrity. It's a shame, but we are. And the, the very fact that his fellow Republicans in the House don't have the courage to come forward and ask him to resign publicly, to me, is, is a sad, sad state of affairs. You know, and I've talked to so many, and their spin, the spin that they've been given by the control, by his lawyers and the speaker is, y'all got to just say, hang tight with me, innocent until proven guilty. Innocent to proven guilty. And I understand they had a knockdown drag out, you know, uh, caucus meeting about that. And they said, y'all have got to stand by me and say those are the words y'all got to keep well, holding on to. They need to stand by the truth and the facts and get rid of Mike Hubbard. He's no man. He's just a, he's an opportunist. He needs out of the house. Where's Tammy Wynette when you need her? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, well, we're going to have to hold it right there. You've been watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics. You can catch new stories every day on alreporter.com, and you can catch us every Sunday on your ABC affiliate throughout the state. He is risen. Happy Easter.